education. I think it's a lot that we can learn and to realize that it's not just in the UK, this is around the world, lots of black autistic people in particular as well, people in the BME community, people who've got Juru heritage community, Asian community, are all experiencing the same challenges because of the stigma. And Jackie is obviously gonna talk about that. So over to you, Jackie, I mean, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and I am so very excited to be here. Um, Vanessa and I have been talking for so long about doing something like this. And I think that it's just amazing to have this opportunity uh, be handed to us literally uh, in a time that it could be just very scary and that still so many good things are coming out of it. So I'm very glad to be here today and please feel free to ask any and as many questions as you would like. And I'll try to do my best to answer them. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. Um, again, my name is Jackie Pilgrim. Um, I was diagnosed late in life, right around the age of 46. And how I came about getting diagnosed is kind of a strange thing. Um, after my parents died, I wanted to, I sought getting therapy because I wanted to deal with some childhood trauma. And I also wanted to add, get some answers for questions because one of the things I had always been told all my life was that I didn't act like other people and I didn't talk like other people. I didn't seem like other people more so when I was young. Um, so I wanted to look into why that was. Also, um, I had a son who was diagnosed with autism. Um, and before his diagnosis, and we can talk a little bit more about how he got his diagnosis too, because it took a while to get a diagnosis of him, even though he started presenting autism right around the age of two and a half, which is kind of right in the scope of when it normally does, he wasn't actually given a, a formal diagnosis until he was nine. Um, but anyway, so one of the things I noticed while trying to get my son diagnosed was that he had a lot of similarities to me, I saw a lot of traits and behaviors that he had that were very close to what I had as a child. Um, loving dark, tight spaces, um, the flapping, the stimming, the repetitive behavior. Um, the difference, the main difference between my son and myself, um, and I don't like the term high functioning, low functioning. Um, I prefer to look at it as a person who may require more supports, more outward supports. So my son requires more outward supports than I do. But that doesn't say that a person who acts like me or looks like me that's on the spectrum isn't severe because we do have severe traits. It's just not as obvious as it is for someone like my son whose traits tend to be more pronounced because they're more visible to you with behind his behavior. So anyway, so when I started the the journey of getting a therapist and going through several screenings, I mentioned this information to the intake person. So oddly enough, when, when, I, when I read over my documentation, I saw that they sent me to get um, an analysis for autism, but they did it to rule autism out which I didn't know until I think last year when I was looking over my paperwork. So they wanted to rule Asperger's out, but instead they actually ended up giving me a diagnosis. Um, it was a three day process. It was kind of grueling. Some of the stuff I knew was part of the test and other things I think they were just taking me through a series of tests that I was completely unaware of and was not made aware of until after the fact, just before they gave me my diagnosis. Um, Oftentimes tell people when I do tell my story <clears throat> and talk about my childhood, I tell them that I, I was that strange kid. Um, I was the one who didn't talk much. I was the one who always turned their desk to the wall. And I turned my desk to the wall because it was the bright lights and the talk, teacher talking and moving and children moving was just a lot to deal with. And it was just so much easier if I could face the wall and just everyone be behind me and I could kind of focus more on what the teacher was saying. But I didn't have a way of expressing that to her and I was always getting in trouble for doing that. I remember one day the teacher spun my desk around and dragged me to the front of the, the classroom and screamed at me to the point where she was literally spitting in my face um, because she was frustrated with me turning my desk to the wall. Um, I was also that child that held, I held my face 
approximately two inches from my paper when I talked and my pencils had to be sharpened to precisely one inch so I could hold it a certain way, um, which was most comfortable for me. And I, I remember writing and always being enthralled by the sound of the, 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 the lead hitting the paper and the texture of the paper and the texture of the desk and the feeling of the air moving around me and everything. And it's just, I just felt, I was so sensitive to everything that was happening around me. Uh, when I felt stressed, I tried to squeeze myself into the tightest ball that I could in the darkest spot that I could to go into in a classroom or in a bathroom or in a closet would be the best place for me. So when I noticed that my son was doing things like that, um, that was what made me wonder. And even though I wondered, I was still surprised when I got the diagnosis. And I, I remember on the way home having to pull over because I was crying. Um, because it's one thing to suspect that you're on the spectrum and it's another thing to be told that you're actually on the spectrum. And what does that mean for me from here on out? Um, but it didn't take long for me to really appreciate the fact that I did get a diagnosis um, because I felt like through that, I felt like he's a blessing actually, because I can really understand when I look at my son and I see what he's going through and I see the things that he's having to deal with and teaching him how to cope and whatnot, I can understand him from a lived perspective and in a way that's really also nonverbal. Because I can, I can communicate with him on his level and I understand all of his communication because I know that everything he does is a communication. His behaviors are part of his communication and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, could we please go to the next slide? Thank you. I wanted to focus today um, because I had the good pleasure of talking to uh, Melissa Davies last week and she brought up some really good points. She wanted to talk about what it was like to cope, especially as a single parent, um, what kinds of suggestions I could make. So the first thing I always suggest when I talk to parents is be aware of your mental health. And you see here I think good mental health starts at home. So before you can become the advocate for your child, you must advocate for yourself. Uh, you need to include in your plan for your care of your child a way to provide self-care. You have to think about what do you need to happen in your day to allow you to operate at optimum? Uh, do you need breaks away from everyone? Do you need quiet time? You know, those kinds of things. And even though you may not get them right away, you can start planning and looking into ways of trying to incorporate that time into your schedule by helping your child understand through a series of tasks, therapies, uh, developing a dialogue even, and letting them kind of cue in and letting you know that I need a break. And also reassuring your child that when you're taking a break, that you don't love them any less because you need a break and that you are not angry with them because you need a break, but it's just something for you. And, and when you do that, also allow the child to have breaks from you. So that is a give and take. You know, I know that my mommy's been working with you all day. You take a break and you get to go play a little bit by yourself for five minutes and use the terminology, take a break. So when they hear you say, I have to take a break, they can relate to and they understand that it's not a harmful thing to them or to you. Um, also, you know, I know that parents married or single, we are extremely busy. So it's hard to keep up with everything. And sometimes it's even hard to to change our mind to even focus on what we need. So if we could just make a list, jot a list down, tuck, stick it up on the refrigerator or whatever, think about the things that you want. You know, think about your supports. Who's supportive in your life? Is it a family member, maybe a friend, maybe a church or a church member? Uh, do you have a therapist? You can write them down. Um, maybe your faith practice, you know, if you have a faith practice. Uh, maybe you could start looking for support groups you know, if you want, um, and start getting engaged in that and, and just finding a way, some kind of out. Just remember to do things for yourself because you're going to spend an awful lot of time working with your child, advocating for your child, fighting for your child, literally, um, and trying to deal with your child and all of the things that they're going through. So in all of that, if you could just remember to have something for yourself and to do some self-care, it will help you in the long run. Next slide, please.
So uh, one of the things I want to talk about, and I'm going to, I'm kind of like jumping around and this is kind of a dual thing. Another thing Pastor Melissa talked about was dealing with children, maybe meltdowns and that kind of thing. So I want to talk about not only the stress that it is for a parent to take care of a disabled child, but the stress it is for the child just to function every day. Um, one of the things I found most interesting in my research was seeing that life expectancy was really significantly lower for people that were on the autism spectrum, especially if they had an intellectual disability. And I mean, especially if they have an intellectual disability in place. And I understand that better now because my son is an adult and I get it. Um, when you're looking at a person that has autism and you see that they have a life expectancy of 39.5 years, when the average life expectancy is 70 years, oftentimes that's, that's because there are health issues in place. And if the person, even if the person's able to talk and express themselves, they may not be able to express what they're going through at the time or be able to express in a way that you can understand. For example, my son has severe gut issues. And he can't really come to me and tell me my stomach hurts or my abdomen hurts. So what he does, sometimes he will self-harm, meaning he'll pick skin around his finger or he'll bite his toe and cause it to bleed or he'll pick away his shirt and he tends to pick his shirt to the point where it's, you can't even recognize that it's a shirt. I could see how that kind of behavior would agitate a parent, especially if you're struggling and trying to make money and your child is picking their clothes apart. And the first reaction would be to be angry. But if we could set anger aside and set frustration aside and understand that when a child like this has a behavior, that they're communicating something to you. And if you're not angry, then you can use your mindset to try to figure out what it is they're trying to communicate. Because when he does that, he's communicating that he feels sick. And when he's starting to feel sick, that means that he's getting impacted. And he's getting impacted in his colon and in his rectum. And as his mom, I have to figure that out and give him the necessary medicines or get him to the doctor and see what's going on. Because that condition, if not taken care of, can kill. Okay. So when our children start behaving out of the norm, when they start hitting themselves or getting angry or getting agitated, before you get angry, try to stop and ask yourself, what is it that they're trying to communicate to me? And even if they don't fully understand, it's so comforting if you say, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm gonna to try to help you figure it out. Help me to help you understand you. And if that will calm them down and you won't be angry, and then you'll give them time to calm down and give you time to kind of assess and see what's going on with them. Another thing that I think is very important for parents, once you realize something's going on with your child and you're going through the necessary channels to get the professional help that you need, document what you see. Document the child's behavior prior to the changing, after what's going on, if there's some sort of outbreak or outbreak in um, behavior or whatnot, write it down. And even if you look over it later in life, think about what might have occurred before the child had the meltdown. Was there a change? Was there a change in weather? Sometimes a change in lighting. Does it happen before school? Does it happen after school? Because in many times, more times than I could count, oftentimes when children come home from school, you know, they've been in school, they're, they're dealing with whatever they're dealing with in school and they come home and they come home and they want to decompress. They just kind of let it all go, all the frustration, everything comes out. And sometimes as parents, you know, our children get home, especially when they're older children, we may require things. We might say, we want you to do a chore or you need to go do your homework or you need to eat or we're talking to them and they're not ready to talk to us because they're trying to decompress. And so then they blow up at us. So maybe just experiment and see, try allowing the child to come home, give them 15 minutes to decompress, give them a chance to go into a space that's safe, maybe if it's their room, allow them maybe to have different kinds of lighting in their room, a lamp that can adjust. So if they need bright light or if they need it to be dim light and it could be quiet space. If it's a child that needs kind of like a tight space, you can help them build a little fort in their room with a sheet 
and a couple chairs and they can go into the fort in that dark space with some stuffed animals or a book and a flashlight and just have that time, give that to them. And then when they come out, they'll be calm, they will have decompressed, they'll be ready to hear what you have to say, they'll be ready to do what it is that you want them to do and not blow up. So oftentimes we can avoid a lot of the things that are giving us trouble just by taking a little bit of extra time and allowing them to decompress in their day and understand that the behavior that they're exhibiting is part of their language. We need to learn their language. And oftentimes we don't take the time to do that because the professionals are telling us that this is undesirable, you wanna stop this behavior, this is behavior, 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 and this is something that we have to change, get a therapy, here, take a pill, and oftentimes those things are not necessary. They're trying to tell you what's going on with them the best way that they can. We as parents and advocates and carers, we have to learn how to listen. Okay, all right. So oftentimes with people such as myself, they consider higher functioning. Um, the leading cause of death with us is health issues and suicide. And oftentimes we tend to be more prone to suicide because we experience pressure every day. Everybody experiences pressure. One of the things that I really kind of get tired of hearing when I tell somebody that, I'm, that I have Asperger's or that I'm on the spectrum and they start asking me questions about my traits and when I start telling them the traits and they say, well, everybody does that. Yeah, because everybody's human. We're not less human because we're autistic. The difference between an autistic person and a person who's not autistic is how we re respond to the stimuli around us, how stress, how we respond to stress, how we deal with things, how we communicate things, how we react to things. So it's not that I'm going to have a reaction that's so different from yours, but my in terms of just, you know, I'm going to get angry, but I may get angrier than you get, or I may be more animated than you get, or maybe I may not show anything because I have a delayed reaction and I'm not able to respond at that time. You know, it's something that, you know, I can't help because of my cognitive ability. So with suicide being so high for people like us, it's again imperative for us to be able to give our loved ones who are on the spectrum or who have an intellectual disability that safe place at home in a place where they feel that someone can understand them or someone wants to understand them. That helps a lot. If we're being yelled at at home a lot and we're being beaten up by trying to fit into a world that we don't fit into, we really don't have any place else to go. So that's why sometimes suicide appears to be an option. And so the more support that we give to other people and each other as family members and friends, then the less likely people will turn to suicide to escape. Next slide, please. Disability whether you are the disabled person or you're the care of a disabled person can oftentimes lead to isolation. Um, and we might not even be aware that we're isolating ourselves or that we're being isolated. I've talked to a lot of family members and, and friends that have a child that's on the spectrum or a child that has any kind of disability. And you find that they don't go to family functions like other family members. Uh, they don't go out to eat or they don't take their child out to eat with them oftentimes because of the fear that the child is gonna start flapping or maybe start squealing or squawking or maybe run through the restaurant, you know, and they feel embarrassed by that behavior. They feel like someone's going to judge them and say, oh, look at that parent. They don't know how to control their child and all that negative kind of thing. Um, so to keep from going through that, we forsake a social lifestyle. We forsake any kind of pleasure that we could have outside of home, we start isolating our children. And if we are blessed to have help with our children, sometimes the child stays with the help. I've seen instances where children um, are with the help every weekend and they're not with their families. Their families are kind of like living a separate life while the child is with the carer. And that shouldn't be how you need to have the child with you. How are they going to learn how to behave out in public with you if you don't take them? Um, my son, because I'm I was married. 
Um, and my husband left when my son was nine months old. So I've been a single parent. He's now 20. I've been a single parent all this time. Um, so, and I worked, you know, started working when he was healthy enough for me to work. And oftentimes I would have to take him with me to work. I had to take him with me to meetings, luncheons. Um, not to mention that I actually enjoy being with my child and I enjoy taking him with me. Um, I didn't have an issue with him flapping or behaving in public, um, I guess because I just understood it. And so if he was happy and joyful and he started flapping or flitting, you know, I would flit and flap with him because it was a sign of happiness and I love to see my child happy. And oftentimes he would sing and carry on. And at first people might look at us and, you know, stare or sometimes they'll be like, you know, I'm sorry. And I'm like, don't be sorry. I'm like, we're happy, we're joyful. And we just have a great time. And before you know it, some of the onlookers let their guard down and they join in the fun. We've had times when me and Hunter and several other people were in the aisle at the store singing songs. You know, sometimes our actions help other people have healthier reactions to us. If they look at us and they perceive that we're ashamed, and that we're fearful, and that we have some kind of blame or whatever, then they're going to treat us accordingly. But if you're loving life, and you're loving each other, and you're not ashamed, and you're just doing what you do, and they see how happy you are, they'll celebrate that with you most of the time. So, you know, enjoy yourself. Allow yourself time and the ability to enjoy yourself and your child, the child that's a blessing to you. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we go with some more coping strategies. I've always talked about coping strategies. That's one of the things and I keep pressing it because as parents, we tend to, as I said before, we tend to forget ourselves. Um, one of the main things is to make peace with the fact that your child has a condition. Um, do not take it as something personal. It's not a punishment for past sin or anything like that is a health condition that can happen to anyone. So make peace with that and make peace with your child. And remember that your child is your child, that you look at them and you're learning them as a human being and not as a walking diagnosis. They are a human being that has a diagnosis, but they're a human being first. So that child is gonna have traits, is gonna act like maybe your mother sometimes, your grandmother, your uncle, you're gonna see facial expressions that possibly that uh, may resemble other family members. Notice that first, and then learn how the condition affects them. Um, always incorporate your faith practice. If you have a faith practice, practice it, and believe that that will help you, and it'll help you get through. Um, Make a list of your self-care, as I said. Educate yourself. Always educate yourself. And always think in terms of whenever you're setting up therapies, whenever you're looking at what the child's learning in school, think of it in terms as they have their early education, and that needs to also transition in the education of an older child, and it transitions into adulthood. So things kind of have to follow a pattern because you want to give the child the skills that they need to be able to progress and do as much independently as possible. Um, talked about learning the child's language and documenting. And one thing that is most important, ask for help. Ask for help. Um, there's nothing, there's no shame in asking questions. There's no shame in saying, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing. I can't figure this out. I'm tired. I need help, you know, and ask reliable resources. That's why it's so important for us as parents in the community. We have to start talking to each other more. Let me put it to you this way. When you go to the doctor and you're asking questions, maybe about a specific trait or something, and the doctor says, well, you know what? I don't really know. I'm not heard of that before. Okay, so don't just stop at the doctor. Keep researching, keep talking to other parents. You may find another parent that may have experienced a similar trait with their child because typically what the doctors can only tell you is what they've learned. If they, have, if they don't have a lived experience, they have their education. The basis of science is questions. All science is, is questions and is seeking answers. 
So how science is built is they look at a group of people and the most common issues that are talked about are the issues or the variables, if you will, that are used in science. So if you're not talking about your issues, your issues will never end up in science. They'll never be studied, they'll never be discussed. So talk and let people know. And if you don't know, and if they don't know, be able to talk to the child's provider and say, well, you know, if you don't know and I don't know, maybe we can put what we do know together and try to figure something out. Let's help each other problem solve this thing. You might be onto something. You never know. You are the ally and you're also the team captain for your child. You are the one who gets to choose the team. You choose the players. You get to choose who the therapist is, the doctors are, and the, the kinds of therapies. You talk to the teacher. You're the front runner. You know, you keep up with everything. And you're the one, you can have people talking to each other. So everything really filters through you as the parent and the caregiver. What, the time that you're willing to put into this and the energy that you're willing to put into and the communication that you make is going to always make things better for your child. Next slide, please. Okay. Make sure, and I know this is a small thing, but it's really important that you eat healthy. What you put in your body is what kind of dictates how your body reacts to things. If you're just eating a lot of caffeine and sugars and sweet things to get through your day, it's going to kind of keep you wired and you're not going to be able to respond as calmly to things when, when they happen. But if you have healthy foods, fruits, low fats, whole grains, whatever it is that nourishes your body, nourishes your mind, feeds your brain, it will help you to be able to function at a higher level. You want to get uh, appropriate amounts of sleep. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm preaching to myself because if anyone else here, I am severely sleep deprived. I've been living off about four hours sleep for the last couple of days. Uh, but I also work from home as well as care for my adult son. And I provide care for myself as well. So getting sleep is very important. Um, it also helps you with problem solving. If you have a, a, a relaxed and mind and well-rested mind, then you're able to kind of see the bigger picture much better. Um, have social outlets also. Uh, if you don't have a lot of time, you know, usually when I do, I like to schedule time to have tea with a friend or a coffee or just, you know, five, 10 minutes just to talk. Um, and not always talking about problems. I mean, we can talk about problems, but you want to talk about the good stuff too. So trying to make it a point every day to look through your day and find some good stuff to be aware of. Um, and again, have something special for yourself. Um, I remember I, I came in contact with this woman in a chocolate factory one time, and she was trying to pick out what kind of chocolate. And so I simply said to her, I said, well, what kind of mood are you trying to set? Do you want uh, to set like a getaway, like you want to have chocolate in a bath with a glass of wine? Or do you want something like a really quick little chocolate that you pull out your purse on the way to an appointment or in the car? What do you want your experience to be? So whatever your treat is, make it an experience. Don't just be mindlessly doing things, but actually really enjoy it, even if it's just a slushy. Really enjoy it, feel it, experience it for those few minutes, and then go on with your day. It really does make a difference. And the last one, again, is don't blame yourself. It's nobody's fault, and it's not a fault. It's a condition. Anyone can have a condition. We all have conditions. We all may not be diagnosed, but whatever the case is, we're all human. And human condition is natural. It's part of nature. So don't blame yourself. Don't feel hard about yourself. Just love yourself and love your child. Next slide, please. Okay, stigma. This is a big one. Um, and one of my favorite subjects to talk about because I think a lot of the stigma that we experience we're not even really aware of. And it's something that's taught. Uh, when I hear parents talk about their kids, I oftentimes hear them talk about their behaviors as being negative. There's always something wrong. They did this wrong. They're not social enough. There's always this deficit, that deficit. And everything's wrong. And please keep in mind, your children are hearing this. So they're taking this in and they're hearing that everything about them is wrong. And that affects them over time. They, they start hating themselves. I start feeling like, well, why do you love me if, if, if everything's wrong with me? So 
a lot of the other things that we have too are these wild ideas like uh, artists, all autistic people are genius or savant or artistic people don't want to have friends. They don't like being social. Well, oftentimes we love being social. Um, and oftentimes we feel very social, um, but we may not appear to be social. And I, and I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, my cousin. I was hoping, I hope she's here today. I don't know if she's here or not. But one of the things that I most remember growing up is being so very different from other people. And I didn't talk much. I didn't show emotions or anything like that growing up. And I did have a couple, just a handful of cousins that enjoyed spending time with me, um, some that tolerated me. Uh, but I had this one cousin. Uh, she always understood me. And it's so funny because when we're talking and she'll describe things like, oh, you didn't really talk much. Um, you never really said much, but we could play for hours and never talk to each other. And it's so very interesting because on my end, even though I didn't talk to him, we didn't talk much, I felt like we had a conversation nonstop. I always felt like I was communicating with her and I always understood all of her communications and words weren't needed. So for me, being social didn't mean I had to be face to face engaging with you or looking you in your face. Just being in the same room of the same mind, enjoying what we're doing and feeling the love and the connection, that was enough. And that's what she gave to me. And I appreciate her for that because she really accepted me for the person that I am. And I'll always love her for that. So don't expect us to have to behave in a way that you're accustomed to or to behave in a way that makes you comfortable to think that we, that's the only thing we can do to be social or to think that maybe we're not paying attention because it doesn't look like we're focusing on anything and maybe we're just sitting in a chair and stimming. The thing that you must know is that we are ultra aware of everything, whether we can respond to it or not. We are aware of your words. We are aware of your feelings, your actions, everything. And sometimes we may react because it's so much coming at it at one time. That's why it's really important that we be able to have a chance to kind of get into a quiet, dark space, not forcing a person or isolating, but giving us that choice, providing a space that if we want to go into a space and get away from everything, we can. And when we want to be out with other people, we can and encourage us to do so. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Labeling behaviors. This is what part that I find most interesting. And I hope you understand me. This is the biggest part of stigma. Because most of the time, stigma is when people just have a general, generalized idea of what a person's behavior represents for a group of people. So when you're labeling behaviors, I've got behaviors here of the we and the they people. So the we, we got the no diagnosis and the they or they have a diagnosis. So for the no diagnosis person, say a person say, we like things. But if you have a diagnosis in place, it doesn't equate as we like things. It becomes we're fixated on objects. If you don't have a diagnosis, we try to make friends. But if you do have a diagnosis, you're seeking attention. Or if you take a break when you don't have a diagnosis, if you do have a diagnosis, you're going off task. And it's the same thing. I don't understand why a diagnosis, a word, can change everything from something positive to a negative. If you don't have a diagnosis and you insist on doing something and you're well within your right to do so, but if you have a diagnosis, you're having a tantrum. Uh, if you're standing up for yourself, that's a good thing. But if you have a diagnosis, you're non-compliant. If you change your mind, which you're entitled to, that's fine. But if you have a diagnosis, you have a short attention span. So one of the things that I noticed, especially getting diagnosed so late in life, is the way that I was treated prior to knowing that I have a diagnosis or prior to saying that I have a diagnosis and how I'm treated afterward. Now, if I don't tell people that I have autism, nine times out of 10, they're not gonna know unless you've been around me for a long time or whatever, but just meeting me or just spending a few minutes with me, you're typically not gonna know that I'm autistic. But if I told you I was autistic, how would that make you feel? 
would your mind start searching for ways to try to relate to me, even though I haven't indicated that I can't understand you? Would you start repeating things over and over again? Would you start talking to me slower? One time I was at a doctor's appointment and I didn't mention to him that I was on the spectrum. He looked on my chart and he saw it and he turned around and instantly started talking very, very slow and asking me if I was familiar with different procedures and things that a woman would typically be familiar with, especially a woman of my years. And I found myself telling him, I wish that you wouldn't talk to me that way because I'm an intelligent thinking person. And I was insulted that I would have to say such a thing. And I had to say it more than once. And he still didn't get it. So it's not about looking at a person who has a diagnosis and trying to treat them according to what you know or what you think you know about diagnosis. It's about looking at a person as a person and learning the person as a person and then discovering how their diagnosis may affect them, giving them a chance to even explain it to you you know, if you will, but don't treat a person differently just because they have a diagnosis, whether you suspect it or not, or you just heard it. Treat them as human beings. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. And think about that with your kids. Some of the worst treatment I've ever gotten has been from the parent on the autism spectrum like me. And I think to myself, would they want someone to treat their child like that? Next slide, please. Okay, so causes for what is considered negative behavior. It could be a very simple thing. It could be lack of sleep. It could be being hungry, uh, frustration, fear, overstimulation, as we've talked about in the past, or maybe a need for stimulation. You know, there's a such thing, you've got the hypersensitive child that is hypersensitive to everything that's happening and they react. But you also have the hyposensitive child that seeks stimulation. I was one of those hyposensitive children. Okay, so I was an, I, I sought things. I, I loved the tactile feel of scratchy paper, balled up, crinkled up aluminum foil. And also, I have to also warn you, sometimes, especially with Aspies, you might want to be a little bit careful what you teach them because we are resourceful when we use things. Like when I learned that water was a conductor of electricity, I decided to lick my fingernail and stick it in a socket, okay? And discovered electrical current. And I would do that as often as possible. Thankfully, I'm here to tell you about it. So hot surfaces, cold surfaces, rubbing, touching, chewing pencils, uh, chewing rubber things. I used to chew the arms and legs on my dolls. So I was always seeking stimulation. Um, it was very, comforting to me. It did something, it was almost euphoric for me. Just the, the, the chewing motion and everything, it just, it does something. So if you have a child, if you see a child chewing pencils and whatnot, yeah, you want to stop them from chewing the pencil, but you might want to give them something like um, some clean toothbrushes or something that won't hurt them that they can chew on. And so oftentimes they'll grow out of it. I grew out of it. My son even grew out of it. I used to give him toothbrushes and let him just chew away all he wanted and then one day he just stopped which I hate it but um so you want to try to find something for what what could be perceived as a negative behavior you want to look for a positive outcome say if you have a child that loves to tear paper and they tear paper magazines all the time why don't you go maybe I don't know here in America the post office they have bins where they have unused magazines so you could just go in the bins and get all the magazines you want for free Take them home, teach the child, these are your magazines, they're put in a certain spot. You let them tear the magazines as much as they want to and you gather the pieces and you put them in the bag. Then you get some glue, a brush, and some paper and you show them how to make art. That's when you take a negative thing and you turn it into a positive. Who knows, you might be cultivating an artist. Maybe one day they'll be selling their paintings online. You never know until you explore the positive. Um, also, one of the things that causes behavior is a lack of control. It's living a life where we don't get to make decisions. Some of us less than others. Sometimes from the moment we get up till we go to bed, we have someone constantly telling us what to do, what to wear, when to brush our hair, what to eat. 
we very seldom get choices. Well, it might be one thing when we're little, but when we grow up, because progression doesn't stop just because there's a disability in place. They grow up and they are aware that they're growing up and they want to exert their power. They want to make decisions. So make it a point with your children early on to give them a safe place where they can make decisions and feel empowered about the things. Let them participate in what's going on in their lives. Even when it comes to health issues. With my son, he has breathing issues. One of the things I let him do was learn and touch and manipulate the things that we have to use to help him breathe. Doctors were telling me, oh, you shouldn't let him play with that. But I'm thinking if he gets to handle it, then he won't be afraid when I put this mask on his face because it's something that will be safe and he'll realize on his own terms that it won't hurt him. So oftentimes, regardless of what the situation is and regardless of what the outcome is, if it looks, no, if it looks negative, there's usually a positive way or something that we can do to kind of bring a positive situation into the life. And that comes from being creative, being creative problem solvers, being well rested, not being angry and frustrated, and looking at the bigger picture. Next slide, please. So what I've got for you now is just kind of a bunch of stuff. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not aware of the time or anything. Um, but this is just some ideas I put together, some amazing things. You can buy these things if you want to, and I have listed links where you can order them. But a lot of the stuff you could probably make yourself. You can uh, go on YouTube. They have amazing uh, do-it-yourself videos on how to create these things. For my son, like with the sandbox and the sensory play games, one of the things that I had for my son, um, Xerox boxes, the, the boxes that Xerox paper come in, I used to save those boxes from work and I would make PlayStations for him. Um, one of his favorite ones was sand play. But I didn't use sand because I was afraid with all of his gut issues and if he swallows the sand, it would be damaging. So what I used was instant grits. A five pound, 10 pound bag of instant grits and some toys. And so if he got a little bit in his mouth, I wasn't worried about it, but I taught him not to eat it but I wasn't worried if he got a little bit in his mouth. And he loved it. all kinds of beach toys and things. I had another box that had different kinds of puzzles. I had another box that had um, instruments. So having PlayStations around the house where it's just not the same thing and the child can swap out PlayStations, maybe in different color boxes, maybe even have the child give them some crowns and markers and have them paint the boxes in different colors that they want, all these kinds of things. It's, it's the kind of thing that helps them have ownership of the things that they're involved with, they get to be creative, and they have choices. And you always want to give choices. Um, we also have wonderful things here, like the weighted lap pad, which reminds me a conversation, another conversation I had with Melissa last week. She had mentioned that her son doesn't sleep much. Well, frankly speaking, there's a lot of us on the spectrum that don't sleep much. I started having sleep disturbance at the age of 13. My son started having sleep disturbance at the age of 13. The difference between he and I is that he developed epilepsy. So with epilepsy, it's imperative that sleep happens or else you tend to be more prone to seizures. I, I don't have seizures, so it doesn't bother me not to sleep. Um, and I oftentimes will not consider taking sleep medicine because I have to hear if something's going on with my son in the middle of the night. I have to be able to get up and check on him. So I, I'm pretty good with it, but he has to take medication. But one of the things that helps him sleep is that weight. And this happens for me too. It's something about feeling weighted or wearing a weighted vest or having compression that is very soothing and calming to us. Um, I've heard people describe it as not being able to feel yourself in space. It's almost like you don't know what to do with your extremities. I mean, you know you have your arms, but it's almost like you seem like you're weightless, like you're kind of there and not there. And having something that gives you pressure or compresses and makes you more aware of your core is very calming. So if you have a child that's not sleeping really well, you might want to consider a weighted blanket. And you don't have to get a blanket and have it all the way up to their neck or their face. You can just get a weighted blanket and drape it across the foot of their bed or maybe where it drapes across their legs where they can feel that weight somewhere on their body and it will help them calm down and to be able to sleep and sleep longer. 
So that's a consider. And they also have weighted blankets for fidgeters. If you want to fidget, you have little things that you can manipulate on the blanket and they can just fidget until they drift off to sleep and still have that nice weight. As a matter of fact, wait a minute. I got a couple things here. I don't have to just show you a picture. I can show you. This is an actual weighted vest. It's, it's a little vest for a little girl. And it's very heavy. It looks really light, but it's very heavy. Um, let me open it up and I can show you what the weights look like. Um, one of, We had a local nurse that actually makes these. Um, and a good friend of mine gave me this one. So there's all these little pockets on the inside of the vest. And in the pockets, this is like Play-Doh or some kind of clay that she has wrapped up so the child can't unwrap it. And she slipped these into the pockets. And she has it set, let's start to get this inside out. So you can adjust the weight. Here we go. Adjust the weight. So here's the pocket. Okay. You see, the Velcroed, and then you put the weight inside. Okay, so if she doesn't need a lot of weight, you might want to take a couple of them out and just Velcro it, and then she can have lighter weight. And if she needs more weight, then you just add the weight back in and go on from there, which I think is a really nifty idea. So again, you know, if you can't find these in the store, they offer patterns. There's places online that offer patterns where you can actually make your own and you can adjust it to the weight that you want to make it for whatever the child needs. Um, also, this little ditty. This, I actually, this thing is 19 years old and it still works. Um, it's, I got it from one of our pharmacies. It's one of those little uh, massagers. Um, people use it for like stimulation in their legs and whatnot. I got it because when my son would get overstimulated or when he would start, the, the lights and everything start getting out, I would turn it on. It had a light and I would put it like right at the base of his neck or on the back of his head, you know, just a little bit. And what that would do, it would calm him right down. And when he was a little baby, I would take the batteries out and he would just sit there and just kind of chew on the little nodules and whatnot and just hold it. And the top part is real squishy. And then when he got older, I would turn it on and it would move around on the floor and whatnot. So I used it all kinds of ways with him just to entertain him and, keep him from getting upset, you know, again, because I had to take him with me to meetings and whatnot. So this was always in his diaper bag. It was a lifesaver. Um, and different other little things, spinners that I'm sure you're familiar with. Little balls, tactile kind of balls, things that they can manipulate, play with. Got a spinner. My son never liked the spinner. He just, he spun it one time, and then he went and he put it in my room. So, and then this, for the kid that loves to mouth stuff and chew, this is a, a safe chew toy that they can chew on. You don't have to worry about anything breaking off and then uh, swallowing it. So it's good to have a little bag and I just have a little plastic bag, you know, or if you have a, a bag that you carry, change of clothes or snacks or whatever for your child, it's good to always have a couple things in the bag. One of the things I did not do, which I see a lot of parents do, they usually have devices. And I always said, well, if the device breaks, what do you do? Because <laughs> they're not cheap and you're gearing up for a meltdown. And one of the things you don't want to do is gear up for a meltdown. So you want to teach children kind of how to entertain themselves and to use manual things, write and, and whatnot. And that, and let the let the device be a treat, an occasional treat that they can choose to carry sometimes or not. Don't get them where they're hooked on and have to have something all the time because that day that you forget it or that day that it breaks is going to be a very, very hard day. So if you could, uh, next slide, please. When I talked earlier about decompressing, these are some things that help children decompress. You see the weighted vest there in the center. Um, oftentimes, good stimuli is being able to swing 
or jump, getting like the mini trampoline with the little handlebars so they can jump as much as they want to. You don't have to worry about them falling off. And then you have the body sock, which is real fun. Um, it, it gives them that compression. It gives, it's almost like, if you, if you will, in a sense, it's almost kind of like going back to the womb, you know, you kind of in that safe, enclosed place. We may not remember what it's like to be in the womb, but our bodies never forget. So having this wonderful little sock or the sensory sack and whatnot, it kind of gives you that sense of like when you swaddle a baby and they're soft swaddled and snug and everything and, they, and it calms them, it soothes them. This pretty much does the same thing. Same thing for the, uh, the Yogi Boo. It's a little ball. It's a nice look. If you don't have a tight corner for your child to go into, then they can have this little ball that they can get into and feel, you know, feel the compression, feel snug, feel safe. And, and the same thing for the weighted blanket. It's all about giving stimuli to the person and allowing them to feel safe and calm. And that's typically what happens. Next slide, please. Here's some other ideas for the bedroom. You don't have to go traditional. There's a lot of non-traditional ways. I was fortunate. I had a bunk bed growing up. So I used to tie sheets all the way around the bunk bed, which kind of represents what these beds look like. And my bed was, it was my spaceship. It was my, my big ship. It was my flying saucer. It was my flying carpet. It was everything I needed to get away from everything else. And that's where I would, read books with my flashlight in the middle of the night and I just felt safe and it kind of cut off all the other stimulation and I could just be calm and and go into sleep and as you see here in that left the first item on the left that's a sensory compression bed sheet it goes around the mattress and it gives the child or the adult that nice compression feel so they can sleep really well through the night and if you have a child that likes to swing you might consider instead of having a traditional bed in their room to give them a hammock and let them sleep in a hammock. It's not unheard of. You know, there are adults that actually uh, have hammocks in their bedrooms because that's the way that they can sleep. They don't sleep on traditional beds. Um, for me, I sleep in a twin size bed. I had a queen size bed, queen size bed one time, but it was too much space. I didn't know what to do with my arms, my legs. It was just, I would just curl up in a ball, in a tight ball and just tremble because it was just too much going on. So I got a day bed with a lot of pillows. And when I get into my bed, it's kind of like a compression and I feel safe and kind of cocooned and I can sleep through the night. And I have a weighted blanket that I throw over my feet and I'm able to actually get some sleep when I am able to fall asleep. So these are some things, I mean, when I give suggestions, I'm not expecting anybody to do as I say or do what I say, but what I'm trying to do is I don't know, foster thought, maybe inspire you to look at things differently and say, well, maybe why don't we try this and we'll try this other thing or try several things and just see what works, um, what brings peace to your life and to the life of your child. Next slide, please. Here is some uh, ideas of compression clothing. Um, you see that t-shirt and these, the way this clothing is set and you can do the same thing with buying clothing a size or two too small, like underwear. Just, just tight clothing that compresses and, and helps you feel centered, helps you feel calm. It's great outerwear. It's great underwear. You know, so if your child goes out, you know, and they're having problems concentrating in the classroom and they, they kind of just really have a hard time calming and soothing themselves you might want to try some compression where they even have a thing and i have a link also for compression sleeves so there might be a sleeve that covers like the forearm or maybe uh the calf or that kind of thing they have weighted things that you can put like around your shoulder just to kind of weight down your shoulders or vest there's all kinds of things that you can try i i really suggest trying anything just being creative be wildly creative and just work with your child and, and, and figure out what works for them and for you. You know, you don't have to be on the autism spectrum for these things to work. There are a lot of parents that experience um, anxiety and weighted blankets. I tell you, if you have a, if you have an appointment, early appointment, I suggest do not use a weighted blanket because you will sleep past your appointment. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So basically from here on out, uh, we just got some links 
uh, most of the stuff that I have and some other additional links, uh, things about Ultimate Guide to Deep Depression and Deep Pressure Therapy. So you can read a little bit more about that. And just do research. Google as much as you can. Look into as much as you can. Ask questions. And take time to, to gather with other people, other moms, other individuals who are on the spectrum, teenagers, adults, uh, older people, and just talk and, and find out what kinds of ways we cope. You know, one of the things that I saw recently, there was a study um, on autism and abuse and PTSD. And in the study, they said that, that children on the autism spectrum had a low, I think, what was the term? What was the term? A low rate of showing post-traumatic stress disorder. And they're like, well, they can't under, really kind of understand why, because if these children are experiencing trauma, why would they not show it? But I think they don't consider the fact that kids who are on the spectrum, that we have so much that we have to cope with every day that we become excellent at coping with problems. So even with severe trauma, we cope. Um, oftentimes it's either we learn how to cope with it or that we may not be able to express it in a way that is understood or that we may not be able to express it at all. Um, it could be a, a number of things. Um, I grew up in a situation where I experienced tremendous abuse. Um, you might have been able to tell, some people could tell, you know, by looking in the face and I looked very sad or something like that. But I had no behaviors that indicated that I was abused. I was very calm, very soft-spoken person, um, very loving person. And I went through emotional, mental, physical, sexual abuse. I never knew from one moment to the next what was going to happen to me. And the abuse happened to me in the home as well as outside of the home. And there was no safety. It didn't even matter when my best friend was visiting, I would still be abused while my best friend was visiting. So there was never a safe place to go, but you wouldn't have known it to look at me. So that's something to really think about. We can't always say that we need help. We can't, and sometimes we dare not say, especially if the person who's abusing us is the person that we're relying on. So those are things to consider. And always, always, always try to just be calm and just first and foremost, love your child, love yourself, and listen. Listen to all of their language, not just what comes out of their mouths. Thank you.